Well, without further ado, let's welcome Jonathan, who's a first-time speaker. Jonathan. Thank you, everybody. Um, so the talk that I'm going to give here in front of you all is Scaling the Security Researcher to Eliminate Open Source Security Vulnerabilities Once and for All. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Thank you all for coming and uh, thank you for being here this early. Um, I know that I had a hard time waking up. I can imagine some of you did as well. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Jonathan Leitchew. Um I'm a software engineer and software security researcher. I'm the first ever Dan Kaminsky Fellow at Human Security. I'm a GitHub star, a GitHub security ambassador, and you can find me um, on J uh, at J Leitchew on Twitter. You can also find me at the same handle on GitHub. Yes. Oh. Everybody can see your second slide. Oh, interesting. One moment, please. Go to logo. Go to logo. I apologize. It's only fun if there's technical difficulties. <laughs> you want to just, if you hop it in, uh, no, I got to make sure that the video is an extender. Right? Yeah. So it's coming up on the, on the stream. Is it's coming out. The same thing you're seeing here is the same thing they're seeing up there. Yeah. Sorry. And that dude walked out. I tried to tell him when he was up here. Okay, it's extended. Maybe just because we changed it mid mid street stream. Maybe if you try reloading, it'll work. Okay. It's the one there. Uh, no. Try it, Ham. Do this. Here, hold on, hold on. No, just go back. Yeah. Can you take us back to screen? SDI. No, it's still. No, 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 I got you. I'm just going to flip it. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Let's take this from the top. <laughs> Um, all right. So, uh, yes, welcome to Scaling the Security Researcher to Eliminate Open Source Security Vulnerabilities Once and For All. <laughs> My name is Jonathan Leitchew. I'm not going to run through all this again, but um, anyways. Uh, yeah, you can find me at twi uh, on Twitter and jlightchew. My DMs are open. Um, also, uh, my co-presenter was not able to make it to DEF CON, um, but his name is Patrick Way, and he's from Modern. Um, and you can also reach out to him on Twitter. So a little bit of a disclaimer, um, I will be, I'm a, uh, first off, I'm sponsored by GitHub, um, I have to say that legally, and also um, the talk, this will discuss a SaaS offering that is sold to customers or to companies, but uh, all the technologies and tools uh, that are discussed here are available for free for open source, and you can use them as security researchers to find these tools uh, without paying anything, so, and fix vulnerabilities as well. Um, so this talk, and the work that I've been doing is just uh, sponsored by the new Dan Kaminsky Fellowship. Um, for those who don't know, um, Dan uh, was a security researcher who was known for a famous vulnerability in DNS back in 2008. Um, I sadly never got the opportunity to meet Dan. Um, he was known as a very, very kind person and a very, you know, people in this community. Uh, he was a cornerstone of this community. And, um, the Dan Kaminsky Fellowship was created um, to celebrate Dan's legacy um, and memory by funding open source work that makes the world a better and more secure place. Um, Human is currently accepting the 2020 uh, applications for the next Dan Kaminsky Fellow. So if you're looking to, if you have a project that helps improve the security of the internet and you're looking for a year long uh, way to finance that as a project that you do full time, um, consider applying to the Dan Kaminsky Fellowship. So my research and this work started with a simple vulnerability. This. Uh, this was in my company's build.gradle file. And I was curious how this ended up there. Uh, it was the use of HTTP to resolve dependencies. And the reason this ended up there was because I had copied and pasted it from an open source project. 
And the reason that using HTTP instead of HTTPS to resolve your dependencies in a, in a build tool like Gradle or Maven is because it's important because you can have your build tool uh, or your, your, the jars that you're downloading um, compromised in flight as they're getting downloaded as an, with an attacker in the middle attack. Um, and so uh, this vulnerability wasn't just in Gradle builds. I found that it was also, this is an example of it existing in Maven builds. Um, uh, this is where the jar that you're downloading gets uh, downloaded uh, and used in the compiler and test dependencies, which means it's actually executed on the developer's machine. And this is where it appears in the upload of your artifact as you're releasing the artifact, which usually includes credentials um, as the upload. So, of course, you're leaking the credentials to upload artifacts as part of your build process over plain text. And this vulnerability was everywhere. Um, it impacted the organizations like Spring, Red Hat, Apache, Kotlin, JetBrains, uh, Gradle, Jenkins, Groovy, Elastic, Eclipse. Um, and on top of that, it impacted Oracle, uh, the NSA, LinkedIn, and Stripe. All of the open source, pro open source projects from all of these different organizations were impacted by this vulnerability. So I reached out to Maven Sonotype. Maven Sonotype is the equivalent of PIP for the Python ecosystem, um, NPM for the Java ecosystem, and they said that when they looked at their traffic in 2019, 25% um, of their traffic was still using HTTP to download their dependencies. So how do we fix this? So on January 15th, 2020, I pushed forward an initiative that decommissioned the support for HTTP in favor of HTTPS only across the major artifact servers in the Java ecosystem and reached back out to Maven Sonotype um, around in January 2020 and they said even after the blog posts, the discussion of this vulnerability, there were still about 20% of, uh, of their traffic that they were seeing using HTTP instead of HTTPS. So you can imagine what might have happened on January 15th, 2020. Broken software everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Stack Overflow posts saying, what happened to my build? Um, but uh, we stopped the bleeding. Um, however, what about the other repositories? These are only the most commonly used repositories in the Java ecosystem. Maven Central, JCenter, Spring, and the Gradle plugin portal. Other companies host artifacts, um, and you see them in the, in the builds of companies, uh, or builds across the uh, ecosystem. Um, unlike NPM or um, uh, PIP, you can declare multiple repositories to resolve your dependencies from. And so you'll see that there's some builds that rely upon five, six, seven, eight repositories to resolve their dependencies across the Java ecosystem. So how do we fix the rest? And I said, well, let's go to the root of the problem and let's just generate pull requests. Let's fix it this way. So how did I do this? Um, the first thing that I needed to do was I needed to identify the projects that were vulnerable. Um, you can know that the vulnerability exists, but like how do you get a list of projects to go fix it in? And so I used CodeQL. Um, co this is the query. I wrote this query to find this vulnerability in Maven POM files. Um, it's very simple. That's it, right? It's very short. And the reason that I use CodeQL is CodeQL scans hundreds of thousands of open source projects on every commit. And you can write it. As it's building this, as you're building the software, as it's building, um, they extract the ASTs and the, they build a database of the code that you can write queries against. And um, uh, GitHub also has a bug bounty program called the GitHub Security Lab bug bounty program. There's actually two bug bounty programs under it. And for this very simple query that I wrote, GitHub bountied me $2,300 for this. Um, you know, not much code, a little bit of documentation. Yeah. And so using the list of vulnerable projects that I was able to receive, uh, retrieve from running this query across the corpus of projects that CodeQL indexes, um, I leveraged, I wrote a pull request generator. It was a Python-based wrapper over hub, which is uh, GitHub's hub CLI. It had one nasty regular expression and a lot of logic for bouncing off of, off of GitHub's rate limiter. And this is the logic. Um, there's an underlying engine, but at a high level, this is the this is what allowed you know us to generate the commits and the pull requests, and this is the regular expression that we used. And you might ask why use a regular expression? We have XML parsers, and the reason that we use XML or we use regular expressions is because um, if you're trying to, when you, when you parse XML into an XML parser and then you make a modification and then you dump it back out, all XML parsers have a standard output. 
And so you're, you'll end up mass generating massive white space diffs across all of the files you're changing, and the maintainers will receive that as a pull request, and they'll be like, I'm not accepting this. Sure, you fixed a security vulnerability, but like, it doesn't look like the code that I have. It doesn't match the editor format that I have. So unfortunately, you have to use a regular expression to fix the, vulner the, the issue. But the problem with regular expressions is that if you use regular expressions, now you have two problems. <laughs> yeah. But it worked. Um, this is my GitHub feed for after I did this, you know, just tons of pull requests, all of the same thing. And this is an example of the diff. Um, you know, you can see the replacement of HTTP with HTTPS. And for this campaign, I generated 1,596 pull requests. And as of today, or a little, about a week ago, um, it, we have about a 40% merge rate for this. And for engaging in this campaign and doing this, uh, on a, in addition to the original bounty, GitHub additionally bountied me an additional $4,000 for this work. Um, so, thank you. So I got hooked on bulk pull request generation. I got hooked on this idea that like, we could actually fix these vulnerabilities at scale across open source. This is my GitHub contribution graph for 2020. Um, you can see I actually engaged in two campaigns um, this year, and you know you can see the actual impact of like you know <laughs> generating it as, as, as what it has on your contribution graph. So I have a problem. Um, I have ADHD, and that's not my problem. The pro yeah, so ADHD is not my problem. The problem is that. I love reading vulnerability disclosures. I go through them, uh, the GitHub security advisories feed, and I can look at advisories and I can see, read the vulnerability and I can be like, okay, I wonder where else this exists. And so I'll run a code kill query or I'll do a GitHub code search search. And the problem is I find too many vulnerabilities. There's more vulnerabilities than I can reasonably report as a security researcher. This is an example of a code kill query for zip slip. I can scroll through pages of these results across open source. In fact, GitHub gave me a list of 900 projects that were potentially vulnerable to ZipSlip. So if I'm finding too many vulnerabilities, how do I fix this? How do I, like I can report one by one. I have to pick out which projects are worth reporting to or I need automation. So now I wanna discuss with you um, a tool that has become something that I've really fell in love with because it's, it's allowed me to do this. Automated, accurate transformations at a massive scale. And so I want to introduce you the tool uh, Open Rewrite. And Open Rewrite, uh, it started out at Netflix. Um, it was written by Jonathan Schneider. Um, and it was developed because Netflix, every single team at Netflix was given and enabled by the, by the organization to write code in whatever format, style, they wanted. As long as they owned the code, they were allowed to do whatever they wanted to develop software. And so if you need to update, for example, Google Guava, which traditionally break, has a breaking API changes every time they release a new version, how do you get your entire organization up to date and using the latest version of a dependency that has a breaking API change every time you update? And so the answer was you need to not just update the version dependency, but you also need to update the code to fix, to update. And so Open Rewrite was created. Um, the traditional problem is that if you compile code, you'll see that the compiler produces what's called an abstract syntax tree. It's a representation of the code in a tree format. But the problem is, you'll notice that if you, if you grab this tree, if you wanted to dump it back out into text, you lose the formatting, the white space, the tabs, because the compiler doesn't care about that information, right? And so open rewrite, instead of, it, it builds, it uses the underlying AST that the Java compiler uses, but it also captures all the other stuff you need, the white space, the tabs, the spaces, into the tree and preserves it so that you can take this tree and it'll, it'll transfer back and forth to the source code. So the white space and, and, uh, and spaces are preserved. And so the generated, and you can also generate new code because as the compiler, or as the, as Open Rewrite is capturing the AST, it's also capturing the tabs, the spaces, how the format, do they use, you know, does the developer use um, braces on new lines? So it can capture all of that and as you're generating new code, also generate it in a way that looks like the developer's code around you or the developing code around you. Um, and 
On top of that, it's also type attributed. For example, this bit of code, if you just saw this, how do you know if this is log for J, SLF for J, log back? They all have exactly the same API, so you need type attribution across the tree to also be able to make intelligent decisions about how you're going to fix these vulnerabilities. And open rewrites AST is, um, it, it's, syntac it's syntactically and semantically aware. Um, you can see that just the syntax alone, when you have type attribution, um, you get a much more rich graph that lets you make much more intelligent decisions. Actually, this, the image on the right is missing about 6,000 lines because it would just be a mess. You wouldn't even be able to see it. Um, and then on top of that, you're tr if you're trying to replace code, you need to be able to take um, you need to be able to take new Java code and put it into the AST to fix these vulnerabilities. And so you need a way to generate new ASTs in an easy way. As an example, for ZipSlip, which I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later, um, we need to inject this bit of code into, um, into the surrounding code. And so how do we do that in a way that's easy and you don't have to write a ton of code to generate a bunch of graph nodes to inject into the tree? And so Open Rewrite comes with a templating engine that lets you just put a string in your code and the templating engine will generate new code that matches the surrounding style of the developer's code that you're working with. And then if you want to inject that into the code, it has a coordinate system that says place this chunk of code after a certain location in the code. And that's all that's required to fix this, you know, to add this little bit of code to fix ZipSlip. Um, and so it lets us take, you know, transform code like this and add that fix where it's required. So what's possible now? What other vulnerabilities can we fix with this unlock that Open, Write, Open Rewrite provides us? I'm going to talk to you about three different vulnerabilities that I tackled with Open Rewrite to fix widespread common security vulnerabilities across open source. The first one is called temporary directory hijacking. The second one is partial path traversal. And the third one is called zip slip. Let's start with temporary directory hijacking. The system temp so the basis of temporary directory hijacking is that the system temp directory on Unix-like systems is shared between all users. Um, so this is temporary directory hijacking. And the reason that you'll find this code in lots of open source and lots of closed source projects is that prior to Java 1.7, there did not exist a public API in the Java standard library to create a temporary directory. So what people did is they created a temporary file that uses a CSPRNG to generate a temporary file name, so it's guaranteed to be uniquely random um, and non-colliding with any of the other files, and they call delete, and they call make dir. And the reason this, vulner this vulnerability is so prevalent is because if you looked up on Stack Overflow, how do you create a temporary directory? You'd unintentionally get a vulnerability. <laughs> And so why is this vulnerable? This is vulnerable because there's a race condition here. Um, you can have another local user um, on the system s waiting for the deletion call, and then make dir, when you call make dir, um, you'll, uh, lost my place. Um, when you call make dir, you're, there's a race condition between the Java process and the attacker to create that directory first. Because if the Java process fails, or if the Java, if the Java uh, process is beaten, instead of throwing an exception, it returns false. So what's the fix? Well, this is a simple fix, but it's imperfect. It does fix temporary directory hijacking, but the problem is that the maker will still use the default uname permissions uh, when it's creating the directory, and so the directory will be exposed to all, will still be visible to all local users. And so instead of temporary directory hijacking, you have temporary directory information disclosure. So what's the true fix? This API was introduced in one, Java 1.7. Java 1.7 is very old. It's, uh, I think, end of life even now. So this API has been around for a long time. You can safely use it. And it lets you create a temporary directory that also sets the POSIX permissions on the file correctly to be secure and not visible to other local users. And so I got a bunch of CVs for this vulnerability. Um, I have a lot of history of getting vulnerabilities, but for this one, I, had, I, I actually reported it to a bunch of projects. But again, I had this problem where I even though I reported it to all these projects, I still had, there were still more vulnerable projects than I could reasonably deal with. And so I said, all right, let's generate some pull requests. So for this fix, I generated 64 pull requests to fix this across open source. And they're probably more possible on top of this, but 
for now, this is as far as I've gotten, and I plan to do more of this in the future. Um, but still, even consider this, reporting to 64 projects, each time, like each one being reported, takes a lot of time, right? So multiply, you know, my time times 64 projects. It's a lot of time spent that this is saved. Um, so the second vulnerability, oh wait, actually I wanted to, so the example, this is an example of the diff generated. And you can see in this change uh, where, you know, we've deleted the delete and the make dir, and we've put in place this fixed, this fixed code. And here's an even more complicated fix. You can see that we've deleted the, the if blocks that are no longer required and put in place that single line of code that's now required. So the second vulnerability that I want to introduce you all to is called partial path traversal. So partial path traversal, let's assume that you have two users on a local system, user Sam and user Samantha. And you want to isolate your code to only allow an attacker to access user Sam. Partial path traversal allows an attacker to access a sibling directory with the same prefix. So, for example, you have user Sam and user Samantha. Um, this vulnerability exists because uh, user Sa uh, Sam is a, is a prefix of user Samantha. And this is the vulnerable code. It's vulnerable because when you take a file and you call get canonical path on it, it returns a string, and that string, you'll notice, has the, uh, it also, it normalizes the path, so it removes the dot dots, you know, any path traversal payloads, but it also drops the trailing slash. And so, when this code ends up being used in a guard, you can see that when you take user Sam, and then you have an attacker supply, user Samantha, um, when get canonical path gets called, and get the path gets normalized. Um, that start with, starts with pass, check, passes, and so the exception doesn't get thrown. And so what's the fix for this? Well, the fix, looking back at the vulnerable, vulnerable code, is to, first, there's, the first fix you can do is you can just add the slash back in. Um, however, the better fix for this is to use the Java path API which is instead of using um, get canonical path, use get canonical file and then call to path on it, which uses the Java path ob object. And when you call starts with on it, it does path comparisons instead of string comparisons, which is going to be safe. So how do we find this vulnerability? Well, first we're looking for a string starts with call, but then we need to look for before and in, in, in inside of the arguments, a call to get canonical path. Um, and then on top of that, we also want to look for cases when we're trying to fix this vulnerability. We want to look for cases where the file separator is not present because if it is present, you don't want to fix, at the core, you don't want to fix a vulnerability that's not there, right? But it can't be that easy, right? What if a developer, because developers are going to write code in a lot of different ways, what happens if a developer extracts that code into a variable? Or what if they pull the other argument into a variable? or they have the fix in a variable. We need something new to make it possible to fix this. So we need data flow analysis. Data flow analysis allows us to track the assignment of values through the program and see what the final value will be at runtime. So we can see that uh, dir canonical is being assigned from that get canonical path call. And additionally, you can do that for other things, and it, it lets you do this for intermediate steps that may be even more complicated than this. So data flow allows us to uncover hard to find vulnerabilities and prevent false positives. And this is the API for data flow for open rewrite, um, something that I developed based upon CodeQL's data flow analysis API. So if you, if you learn CodeQL or you learn open rewrite, you can translate your knowledge very easily back and forth between these two, parad these two paradigms, um, which makes fixing these vulnerabilities and identifying these vulnerabilities significantly easier. And so this is an example of putting it all together. Um, we're able to replace this vulnerable call with the safe version. Um, I want to give you a case study on this vulnerability, um, an example for, uh, from the AWS Java SDK. Um, it has a CV number. Um, I found this vulnerability in the Amazon SDK. Um, it was for the transfer manager, which is used to download the contents of AWS buckets. And they had a check in there to prevent path traversal if the AWS bucket key was potentially uh, a path traversal payload. 
And so you can see this, this logic was vulnerable to path, uh, partial path traversal um, because this leaves root logic was used in this guard to check if the AWS S3 uh, key was outside of a path. And so we got a vulnerability for this. The Amazon security team was very pleasant to work with. However, with any good story, there was a little bit of vulnerability disclosure drama. Um, and this story, I just I had to throw it in there. It was too funny not to share with you all. So um, this was my email conversation with the Amazon Web Services security team. We'd like to award you a bug bounty for this. However, you need to sign an NDA. And I said, I don't normally agree to NDAs. Um, can I read it first before potentially agreeing? And they said, we're unable to share bug bounty program NDAs since it and co other contract documents are considered sensitive by the legal team. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, again, too funny not to share with you all. Um, I have uh, they, I have asked the Amazon Web Services team instead of bounting me to p double the bounty amount and uh, just uh, donate it to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They've yet to get back to me on that particular front. So, we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so the third vulnerability that I want to share with you all is Zipslip. So Zipslip is an old vulnerability. It's been around since Frack Magazine um, many, many years ago. Um, and uh, the SNCC team actually did a bunch of research about Zipslip uh, a couple years ago and found a bunch of projects that were unzipping logic that were vulnerable to this. Um, Zipslip fundamentally is not a partial path traversal vulnerability, but it's a path traversal vulnerability um, while unpa unpacking um, zip files. However, partial path traversal can exist in Zipslip. And some of the cases that I found that the SNCC team reported to, when I looked at the code again several years later, I found that that code, even though it had been patched against path traversal, it still was vulnerable to partial path traversal, which we discussed earlier. And so this is the vulnerable code for Zipslip in Java. And the reason it's vulnerable is because you have the name of a zip entry flowing to the creation of a file, which that file, that get name can be a path traversal payload, and that was fl that's flows to the creation of a file output stream. And so if that's a, par if that's a, pay uh, a path traversal payload, then you can overwrite the contents of an executable file, and then you can get code execution. So zip slip although not directly, it can lead to code execution if you overwrite the right files. And Zipslip is complicated, and the reason that it's complicated is that in order to fix it, you need to add this chunk of logic to the code. However, the problem with Zipslip in this case is that this is a valid fix to this vulnerability, and you'll find this in open source code, but this is also a valid fix. So how, again, we don't want to fix non-vulnerable code, so how do you identify, is this vulnerable or is this not vulnerable? And so we need something new that we haven't talked about yet. It's called control flow analysis. Control flow analysis lets us determine the difference between the vulnerable code on the, le on the left and the non-vulnerable code on the right. So control flow analysis, when, um, when what, what you do is you walk over the AST and you build a graph, or you build a tree. Um, or graph. It's a graph of, um, of the connected nodes where you have basic blocks, which are the set of contiguous operations that are going to occur in order, followed by any of the conditional nodes that exist in the logic. And so looking at partial path traversal, um, uh, or sorry, looking at zipslip, um, you can see that this is an example of the, the uh, control flow analysis graph built for this non-vulnerable code. And so we're able to traverse this graph in, in our logic and determine that, oh, hey, look, you know, there is a guard in place that when it's false, throws an exception. So we're not reaching the vulnerable code where we're creating that new file output stream. And so when we put all this together, we're able to not fix code that's not vulnerable and we are able to fix code that is vulnerable, which is what we want to do. And this is an example of the diff generated to fix this vulnerability. And here's another one where not only have we fixed the vulnerability, we've also cleaned up the code a little bit around it. And so I want to talk to you next about actually doing pull request generation. Because if you've got security vulnerabilities, everybody gets a pull request. <laughs> so there's a problem with pull request generation. And one of the problems is 
how fast can we generate pull requests? So as a part of generating pull requests, there's three major types of operation you have to make, file IO, git operations, and GitHub API calls. Um, the first one is pretty free. The second one, git operations against GitHub are completely free as well. Um, GitHub does not rate limit it, and GitHub has a rate limit, um, which is very annoying, on their API calls. So the first one you need to do, check out and download the code repository. Then you need to branch, apply the diff, and commit the change. Then you need to fork the repository and rename the repository on GitHub. And the reason this is important is because when you're forking hundreds or thousands of repositories, you're going to end up with name conflicts. And so if you don't rename them, you're going to end up saying, GitHub's going to come back and say, there's already a fork with that name, so you have to rename it. And unfortunately, GitHub does not offer an API to do both of those steps in one API call. And then you push the changes, and then you create a pull request on GitHub. And so you'll notice that there's three API calls here that are rate limited, and GitHub asks that you wait at least one second per user per request. So that means that for every pull request you're generating, you're going to have to wait at least three seconds. And on top of that, there's additional secondary and tertiary rate limits that they document with mixed success um, and uh, that you have to be aware of and just deal with. Um, so uh, if GitHub was, in, if anybody from GitHub's in the audience, um, <laughs> it would make my life a lot easier as a security researcher if you just backed off a little bit on your rate limiting. Um, so we've made it this far. We've detected the vulnerability, the style's been detected, or uh, the style's been detected, the code's been fixed, and a diff's been generated, and the rate limit, although annoyingly, has been, has been bypassed. How do we fix this for all the repositories across GitHub? And I want to introduce to you Modern. Modern is a free for open source projects SaaS offering that, um, currently indexes over 7,000 repositories, and it lets you run open rewrite transformations at scale, and it lets you generate and update pull requests. Um, Modern has over 800 open rewrite recipes, including complete framework migrations, and the reason that framework, framework migrations are important is, take for example, Spring. If you want to use the latest version of Spring, um, unfortunately, the latest version of Spring um, requires the latest version of JUnit, which is a testing framework. There's JUnit 4 and JUnit 5. And there's a completely different API between the two of them. And so if you want to be in the latest version of Spring, which as security practitioners, we've probably all heard about why keeping your version of Spring up to date is important. <laughs> um, you also need to keep your test framework up to date. And if you want to migrate all of your code, you have to migrate your entire code from JUnit 4 to JUnit 5 to be on the latest version of Spring. And so even your indirect test dependencies can be a security risk if you can't update them because it'll prevent you from updating the critical components like Spring. So Open Rewrite has transformations that'll let you upgrade those things very, very easily with just a click of a button. And on top of that, it also supports pull request generation. Um, and this is an example of if you found the vulnerability in open source, you can generate pull requests at scale using this technology. And so I want to, this is a quick video of um, what I, when I wanted to fix temp directory hijacking, um, what you're able to do, you can uh, commit the chain, it, it lets you commit with forks, you can set the commit, the branch name, the commit title, um, it lets you create the pull request with uh, GPG key signing, um, uh, yes, I know I'm pasting my GPG key into a SaaS service, but um, it lets you generate your commits with GPG keys and then generates the pull requests. Um, and this is the end result, right? Actually generating pull requests. But I said open, uh, co uh, Modern indexes 7,000 repositories. There are more than 7,000 open source repositories in the world. How do we find the other projects? And so, looping back to the beginning, CodeQL. So CodeQL um, lets it, there's over 100,000 open source projects that they index and over 35,000 open, uh, open source Java projects that are indexed. And so when you write a CodeQL query, to find these vulnerabilities, you can get a list of all the vulnerable open source projects, and then if you contribute that list to the Modern Jenkins ingest pull or, um, repository to the CSV, uh, they will ingest those repositories and let you run recipes against them. So finally, we've finally gotten there. Let's go generate some pull requests. And so 
here's the results of all the different campaigns of open source pull request generation that I've been involved in. Um, the, uh, one of them actually was not directly mine. The, uh, our hostname array overflow, um, was a project done by GitHub, um, using my bot, my Python based bot. Um, but yeah, for, for this past year, I've generated 64 pull requests for temporary directory hijacking, partial pass traversals, 32 and zip slip, oh, a hundred pull requests. And for, for me, I've generated over five, uh, 590 new pull requests in this year alone to fix various different vulnerabilities, new and old projects. And personally, I've generated over 5,200 pull requests across my history of being a software security researcher. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one unfortunate project um, of the three projects that I engaged in as part of the Dan Kaminsky Fellowship um, was the unfortunate recipient of all three pull requests. <laughs> um, uh, this is actually a project that's owned by um, Perforce. Um, they didn't respond immediately when I opened the pull request, so I took to Twitter and said, hey, by the way, I dropped Ode on you, sorry. Um, and uh, they are now aware of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so this is the, um, this is, you know, my contribution graph. Um, you know, actually have an impact in open source. So I've talked about the technology, but now I want to talk to you about some of the best practices for this technique. First off, messaging. You're dealing with real people. You're dealing with real maintainers. Um, there's this great saying, all software pe problems are people problems in disguise. This is very true for this case. You're, you're trying to fix these vulnerabilities with technology, but you're dealing with a real person on the other end of this, which is receiving this pull request, and so you need to be kind, compassionate. You need to understand that you're potentially dropping an O-Day on them, and maintainers are used to bug reports, like that's been normalized, but when you're challenging them with a security vulnerability, um, sometimes ego gets involved a little bit, and that's not a bad thing, but people are not normalized to, hey, you've got a bug in your code, but not only is it a bug, you've potentially put your users at risk because of it. So you need to be conscious of that in your messaging and detail the vulnerability and be compassionate when you're communicating with the maintainer. And so, some shorter lessons. First one, sign off on all your commits. Um, this is what a git, a git commit sign off looks like, and you might ask why. Um, and it was, there was a bunch of lawsuits in open source, TLDR lawyers. <laughs> so um, if you don't want your pull requests rejected by evil dragon bureaucrats, uh, consider just, just GPG, or just, uh, just commit sign and you'll be good. Um, be a good commit -ison. GPG sign your commits. Um, this is what commit signing looks like and uh, you won't end up getting impersonated like Linus Torvald has multiple times on GitHub. Um, <laughs> Uh, CCOM. So CCOM is a standard for uh, the commit message. Um, I'm not going to go into details on it, but and it's not my talk to give, but um, it, fundamentally it's a format for commit messages that fix security vulnerabilities. And if you follow this, it just helps us fall into a, a more normalized uh, way of communicating about vulnerabilities in the commit feed. There are risks to using your GitHub account. Is anybody here familiar with GitHub's angry unicorn? This is my GitHub profile for most of 2020. <laughs> I broke my GitHub account by doing this. Um, so be warned. However, I do recommend using your personal GitHub account um, because when maintainers have questions, concerns, um, rants, sometimes, not often, um, you want to be able to respond with kindness and compassion and understanding and it'll make them understand this is coming from a person who cares about trying to fix vulnerabilities and trying to improve their software, but just can't do it in a way that's private or it, the problem is too big to do this, at, you know, report it to them one by one by one. And then coordinate with GitHub. Um, before attempting, reach out to the GitHub security lab. Let them know you're going to do this because you don't want to get banned from GitHub. Um, Keep them in the loop. They want to know. They're probably they're going to be. They want to enable you. They want to support you. That's what I've done. Um, I have a really good relationship with them. Um, so just keep them in the loop. And then consider the implications. I received this issue shortly after engaging in this campaign, one of my recent campaigns. 
And I use the term coordinated disclosure. Um, I, a lot of people still use responsible disclosure. It's an outdated term. Um, but coordinated disclosure, regardless of the term you use, the answer is no. This is not responsible disclosure. This is not coordinated disclosure. It's full disclosure of vulnerability. If GitHub offered a way to create pull requests that were private, I would use it 100%. I've asked them for it. <laughs> um, uh, so you need to be considerate of, you know, that you're dropping an O-Day on a maintainer and you're going to add stress to their life that they didn't have before and now they've got to deal with what you've given them. So just keep that in mind. But I argue that at the scale at which the vulnerabilities we have, this is the great, is, is it, it's the, the risks and the downsides outweigh this potential negative, you know, the negative consequences of dropping O-Day because of the amount of good we can have by fixing these vulnerabilities at scale. So in conclusion, as security researchers, I believe we have an obligation to society. We are the ones that know that these vulnerabilities exist. We've seen them in pen, we've seen them in pen test reports, we've written them about them, we've seen them in code reviews, they come up again and again, but we are the ones that know that these vulnerabilities exist and we know how to fix them. Unfortunately, a lot of developers out there, surprise, surprise, don't watch DEF CON or Black Hat talks. <laughs> so, we need to be able to, we need to help the community where we can and contribute back. There's a problem, GitHub, uh, estimates that for every 500 developers, you have one security researcher. The odds are stacked against us. But I believe that with this technique and with this, with deploying this, we can fix vulnerabilities at scale. And I believe this is the best way to fix vulnerabilities at scale across open source. And imagine deploying this technology for, for example, to eliminate SQL injection across open source. Or if when open research supports C and C++, we could eliminate entire classes of memory corruption bugs simply by generating tens, hundreds of pull requests across open source, right? Just gone, we've dealt with that vulnerability. Let's move on to something more interesting. So I wanna leave you with one final quote. It's from Dan Kaminsky. It's on his Twitter profile today. We can fix it. We have the technology. Okay, we need to create the technology. All right, the policy guys are mucking with the technology. Relax. We're on it. Thank you. A uh, couple of little sound bites. Um, learn CodeQL. It's seriously, it's an incredibly powerful language. Um, Contribute to Open Rewrite and, uh, and, and CodeQL. Um, and you can deploy your security risk, uh, fixes at scale. And then if you want to chat more with me, I'm, my Twitter, DM is tw Twitter DMs are open. Uh, join the GitHub Security Lab Slack channel and the Open Rewrite, Rewrite Slack channel. And if you want to discuss the wider problem, it's not on the slide, but if you want to discuss the wider problem of open source security vulnerabilities in general, um, there is the Linux Foundation's Open Source Security Foundation, where they're having weekly meetings discussing the critical vulnerabilities and issues impacting open source and securing those things. So if you're looking for something to get in, a place to get involved and it's not directly involved with this, but you want to get involved with open source security, that's a great channel to get involved in and learn more about this topic. And I want to leave a final thanks to Human, my sponsor, and the Dan Kaminsky Fellowship sponsor that enabled me to do this, Modern, who has been an awesome companion and, and team to work with, Lydia Giuliano for being the Black Hat speaker coach to make this talk um, what it was, and Sham, my intern, um, who enabled, uh, he did some of the graphics and with, 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 without uh, control flow analysis would not have come together. Um, so thank you, yes. Thank you all for coming.